One important question in ethics is what makes people's lives go well for them. Philosophers have proposed various theories about what things in and of themselves make people better off. That is, theories of well-being. Many such theories say that pleasurable experiences are at least part of what makes our lives go well. But do some types of pleasure contribute more to our well-being than others? The 19th century philosopher John Stuart Mill answers, yes. This discussion explains why. Mill contends that pleasure is not merely one thing that contributes to our well-being, it's the only thing. Similarly, only pain makes us worse off. Mill thinks that a person's life goes well for her just insofar as she is happy. Mill defines happiness as pleasure and freedom from pain. In his utilitarianism, he describes the best life as an existence exempt as far as possible from pain and as rich as possible in enjoyments. This theory of well-being is called hedonism. Mill's case for hedonism comes in Chapter 4 of Utilitarianism in his so-called Proof of the Principle of Utility. There he contends that the sole evidence that anything is desirable is that people do actually desire it. Because pleasure is the only thing that we desire for its own sake, Mill argues, we can know that it's uniquely valuable. An earlier utilitarian philosopher, Jeremy Bentham, also subscribes to hedonism. However, his hedonism differs significantly from Mill's. For Bentham, how much a pleasurable experience adds to our happiness is strictly a matter of how much pleasure it contains. This in turn depends on the intensity of the pleasure and how long it lasts. So two factors, intensity and duration, determine a pleasurable experience's value. Bentham sees the source of pleasure as irrelevant to its value. He compares reading poetry with playing the mindless game Pushpin. As Mill summarizes Bentham's conclusion, quantity of pleasure being equal, Pushpin is as good as poetry. While Bentham may believe that pleasure is a single feeling that's present in all pleasurable experiences, in contrast, Mill believes that there are distinct varieties of pleasures. A person may enjoy both reading poetry and running, but the pleasures these activities yield can have entirely different feels. It's therefore possible that some kinds of pleasure are more desirable and more valuable than others. Mill believes that some are. Certain qualitatively superior pleasures add more to our happiness than an equal or even greater quantity of others. For Mill, therefore, the value of a pleasurable experience depends on three factors, intensity, duration, and, unlike Bentham, quality. How do we compare the quality of pleasures? Mill says that we must consult people who have enjoyed both. Only they are competent to make this comparison. If they unequivocally desire one more strongly, then it's of higher quality. Of two pleasures, if there be one to which all or almost all who have experience of both give a decided preference, irrespective of any feeling of moral obligation to prefer it, that is the more desirable pleasure. Note the continuity with Mill's proof. The sole evidence that one pleasure is more desirable is that people do actually desire it more strongly. Mill believes that the results of this test are apparent. While virtually everyone has experiences of bodily pleasures that we share with animals, only some people are sufficiently mentally cultivated to enjoy the distinctly human pleasures of the intellect, of the feelings and imagination, and of the moral sentiments to any extent. Those who are, he claims, decidedly prefer them. Mill writes, now, it is an unquestionable fact that those who are equally acquainted with and equally capable of appreciating and enjoying both do give a most marked preference to the manner of existence which employs their higher faculties. This lets Mill answer the objection that hedonists would approve of a person's living a life worthy only of swine, as long as she enjoyed it. His qualitative hedonism can explain why, although such a life would have some value, since lower quality pleasures have some value, she'd be far happier and much better off were her life rich in higher quality pleasures. One practical upshot of Mill's view is the importance of providing an education sufficient for enjoying higher quality pleasures to everyone. People lacking such preparation may not appreciate why these pleasures are superior, 
but they're not competent judges. Mill writes, It is better to be a human being dissatisfied than a pig satisfied. Better to be Socrates dissatisfied than a fool satisfied. And if the fool or the pig are a different opinion, it is because they only know their own side of the question. Some important questions about Mill's views do not receive clear answers. One is whether there are qualitative differences between pains. The other is just how much more valuable than bodily pleasures higher quality pleasures are. Clearly, he considers them significantly more valuable. Controversially, some scholars believe that he considers them infinitely more valuable. Mill may seem to underrate the value of bodily pleasures. His view could seem to entail that we should all spend as much time as possible on rarefied activities like museum visits and opera, and none on exciting pursuits like sports or sex. However, people with developed faculties can find higher quality pleasure in diverse activities and combined with other pleasures. Someone who knows football well may derive intellectual and aesthetic pleasure from it, along with less refined pleasure in the collisions. Sex can be both emotionally fulfilling and physically pleasurable. Mill suggests that the best lives combine tranquility and excitement. It also bears mentioning that Mill had a somewhat unusual life, starting with a childhood that involved little if any play. So he may not have been entirely competent to judge some bodily pleasures himself. <laughs>